Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. What I can tell you is that we're not going to stop until we exhaust every means possible of doing so. We will not leave any person behind and we will do anything to make that happen. A message to the world from the Israeli Defense Force referencing more than 100 hostages that Hamas terrorist organizations say they have taken out of Israel. Those include men, women and children and possibly some Americans. A highly coordinated attack from Hamas militants yesterday forcing Israel to declare war. More than 700 people in Israel have been killed in the attack, thousands more injured. Several sources telling ABC News at least four Americans are among those casualties in the White House tonight trying to confirm if any of those hostages are from the U.S. as well. Israel is still responding to the attacks with massive airstrikes into Gaza. ABC's Allison Kosick reports President Biden is pledging American support for Israel sending weapons, ammunition and a U.S. carrier strike force. The violence began early Saturday. A massive barrage of Hamas rockets fired into Israel. The highly coordinated attack catching Israel off guard. This music festival turning to panic. Jennifer Damte's 22-year-old daughter, Kim, was at that festival. She is now missing. Kim didn't realize that there was like seven or eight Toyota vans full of terrorists and they just shot everywhere. They just shot them, slaughtered them like ducks. The Israeli Rescue Service says more than 260 bodies were recovered at the scene. Videos show Palestinian militants taking Israeli hostages near the border with Gaza, including young children and the elderly. The government says as many as 100 people have been kidnapped. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu declaring we are embarking on a long and difficult war that was forced upon us. ABC's Ian Payne panel is in Israel. I don't know if you just heard that. That's the sound of a mortar coming in from Gaza. This is being fired by Hamas militants while Israelis are trying to deal with Hamas, not just across in Gaza, but also here still inside Israel, where they're trying to clear villages where the militants are holding on. Speculation growing over Iran's possible involvement. Hamas wouldn't be Hamas without the support that it's gotten over many years from Iran. We haven't yet seen direct evidence that Iran was behind this particular attack or involved, but the, the support over many years is clear. President Biden pledging U.S. support for Israel. A U.S. carrier strike group is on its way to the Middle East. The Pentagon sending weapons and ammunition, also moving U.S. warships and fighter jets to the region. Allison Kosick, ABC News, New York. And here at home, the impacts of the attack on Israel are palpable. More than 10,000 San Antonians are Jewish. Many are heartbroken and frustrated. The night team's Daniela Ibarra spoke with several local Jewish leaders today. You join us live in the studio now. What are those leaders? How are they reacting to this? Well, they say this weekend has been incredibly tough, Tim. Today is supposed to be the continuation of a celebratory Jewish holiday. Instead, they're mourning and thinking about what more they can do. Prayers for peace waiting to be answered. It's been heartbreaking. It is incredibly frustrating. Frustrating because Temple Bethel's senior rabbi Mara Nathan is thousands of miles away from Israel. We want to mourn all the folks who have been killed. People have been kidnapped. I mean, it's a really just, it's an atrocious situation. She feels helpless. There's just almost sort of this irrational feeling like you want to run towards the trouble because you hate to just be sitting back and watching it all happen. Watching war unfold has been tough for Nami Iklov, president of the Jewish Federation of San Antonio. It has been an emotional roller coaster. We're in triage mode right now, trying to figure out what needs to be done and how we can take care of it. Tomorrow, Jewish leaders are inviting San Antonians of all faiths to come here to Temple Bethel to pray for the lives lost. There isn't a Jew out there that doesn't want peace. Um, but the challenge is that, that this is not the way to get peace. While San Antonians are rallying in support of Israel, others are backing Palestine. This flyer circulating on social media invited Palestinian supporters to a rally downtown today. To have a rally to support those kinds of behaviors, to me, is an exclusive. It seems just like a never-ending horrible situation where calm and thoughtful people can't find a solution that will help the majority of the population on all sides. A solution to the violence is what many at Temple Bethel will continue to pray for. Be here to support 
um, not just the people of Israel and the state of Israel, but the Jewish community. And I think also just a general sense that all human beings deserve to be safe and secure in their own homes. And with the conflict in Israel, there are concerns of anti-Semitic attacks. Last year, the Anti-Defamation League says anti-Semitism went up nearly 40 percent nationwide. Both Jewish leaders here in San Antonio tell me law enforcement have been in contact with them. Tim, Courtney. Thank you, Danielle. Looking ahead to tomorrow, Texas state lawmakers will return to Austin for a third special session. This time focusing on school vouchers and the crisis at the southern border. Governor Greg Abbott has hinted for months that he would call a special session to get a law passed on school vouchers, which would essentially allow parents to use taxpayer dollars to help put their children through private school. The vouchers were one of Abbott's top priorities in the regular session, but a plan never made it out of the House. The third special session agenda also revives a few proposals dealing with migrants at the border, like increasing penalties for human smuggling and creating a state criminal offense for illegal entry from a different country. The third special session starts tomorrow afternoon at 1. Switching gears now to a look outside with live cam. Temperatures falling into the upper 60s. Still have low humidity in place. A beautiful night underway here in the Alamo City and across South Central Texas. Of course, this is wrapping up what has been a stunning weekend across the area as well. Hopefully you were able to get out and enjoy it. Here's a look at some of the high temperatures for today. We only topped off at 78 degrees here in San Antonio. That's actually seven degrees below the average average of 85 and in fact Rock Springs up in Edwards County only topped off at 73. Now if you enjoyed this morning it's still going to be another cool and crisp start to the day tomorrow around 59 the forecast low temperature at about 7 a.m. 83 is the forecast high so a little bit warmer than what we saw out there earlier this afternoon. As we head into the Monday night and early Tuesday time frame the humidity is going to work its way back into the area not just Gulf moisture but also some Pacific Pacific moisture works in on Tuesday. Maybe a few showers we'll need to monitor for some. This all ahead of another cold front that looks to move in just ahead of next weekend. We'll time it out and get you all the details coming up in just a few. Thanks, Mia. We'll see you then. Taking a look at other stories we've been following today. A 63 year old man is dead after a hit and run crash and police still have not found the suspect. Police say the man was walking across Bandera Road in the 700 block last night when an unknown vehicle hit him and then sped off. The man taken to a nearby hospital where he was pronounced dead. Last check, officials still had not identified the victim. If they find the driver, police say he'll be charged with failure to stop and render aid, resulting in death. The people who live in this west side home are happy to be alive after an overnight fire. It happened in the 7400 block of Timber Creek Drive. Fire crews initially thought those people were trapped inside the house, but as they began battling the fire, it became clear that all of them made it out alive. They were all checked out by EMS and released. Meanwhile, the cause of that fire remains under investigation. Let's turn our attention to the border now. The Biden administration is facing scrutiny and controversy over its recent decision to move forward with the construction of a new border wall in Starr County. According to U.S. Customs and Border Protection, they have proposed to design and construct up to 20 miles of the new border barrier. The night team's Jonathan Cotto reached out to his contacts along the border today who say that construction could come at the expense of some environmental protections. Trump had allocated a certain amount of funding from military construction projects and reallocated it to the wall under an emergency order that he had issued while he was uh, president. President Joe Biden rescinding that emergency order on his first day in office in 2021. Fast forward to today, political science professor Mark Caswan says plans of building the 18-foot border barrier are back on the table. I was told that I had no choice. We had no choice. It was mandated. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas has explained the administration's hands are tied by current laws that mandate the money be used for the wall. I think a couple billion dollars that Congress had appropriated for building walls um, that was still there. And uh, essentially the Biden administration's argument is that that binds them to uh, actually build the wall. The Biden administration waiving 26 federal laws to allow for expedited construction. Oh, that is a negative impact for the people. According to Jasmine Santibanez Contreras, a human rights and environmental activist, 
Some of those laws will weaken major environmental protections. And affect our water, our air quality, our life quality, and our sensitive ecosystem for animals that also depend on the river and crossing those barriers. Caswan references the takings clause, which allows the government to take property if it feels it needs to, but it has to provide fair compensation to landowners. A problem, he says, could delay plans for construction. The federal government has had a terrible time uh, in some cases with landowners who simply are not accepting the compensation that the government is offering. Santi Bañez Contreras says a local Native American tribe and nonprofit organizations are working with landowners and the rest of the community to keep them informed of their rights. Reporting Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. And for more on this story and a breakdown of the environmental laws in question, you can head over to our website at ksat.com. Hundreds of students in Northeast and Northside ISD schools were disciplined for THC vaping last school year. KSAT investigates just how bad vaping has become in some schools and what districts are doing to discourage it. Plus, he played linebacker at Baylor and had a stint in the NFL, but maybe his biggest upset to date is when he defeated a Republican incumbent to win a House seat in the Dallas area. Now, Lone Star State Congressman Colin Allred has his sights set even higher. Plus, the first of its kind for San Antonio. The first ever fentanyl awareness walk is happening in less than a week, and it's bringing people from all walks of life together for one common goal. We'll tell you about it next. And now we'll look ahead to an event that will mark history in San Antonio. This Saturday will be the city's first ever fentanyl awareness walk, bringing local, state and federal leaders to our city to talk about the fentanyl crisis across our nation, including here in South Texas. This comes as Governor Greg Abbott has officially declared October as Fentanyl Awareness Month in Texas. The event was formed by three angel moms, mothers who lost children to fentanyl poisoning. We recently spoke to one of those moms, Veronica Caprosi, who is on a mission to prevent other deaths. Why so other mothers are not sitting here in front of a camera telling their story of their child? This, the Souls Walking for Souls event is this Saturday at 4 p.m. at the Green Line on Sydney Brooks Drive. There will be important speakers, a Narcan training, food trucks, vendors, and a candlelight vigil to honor those lost to fentanyl. I'm lucky to be the MC of that event, and I hope that you'll stop by. You can register online on Souls Walking for Souls website. All right, let's check in with Mia. We're going to see what's happening in the weather world tonight. It has been a very beautiful weekend. Yes. Can we continue this into the week ahead? <laughs> In some capacity, <laughs> but honestly, we do have a couple of different changes that are going to move back in. But another front does look to work in just ahead of next weekend. Before that, a rain chance as early as Tuesday for some, but at least into tomorrow, it's going to be a nice day. I do want to start off, though, looking at this morning's lows in and around the San Antonio area. If you stepped outside this morning, and I hope you did, you noticed the coolness, the crispness. 47 in comfort, stretching over to Kerrville. More 40s for places like Bandera and Bernie. For us here in San Antonio, we officially got down to 54 degrees over at the airport. That makes this morning the coolest one that we have seen since April 30th, which was over 160 days ago. Now, maybe not quite that cool. First thing tomorrow, it still will be nice. I think we'll be able to fall into the upper 50s here in the Alamo City. But after that, we're going to start to see more humidity work back in, and you can see what that's expected to do to our morning low temperatures. Mid 60s by Tuesday, and then closing in on that 70 degree mark by the later portions of this week before we see that next front move in for next weekend. But first, here's a look at tomorrow morning, planning out the morning commute by 7 a.m. 59 here in San Antonio, 55 in Bulverde, stretching over to Bernie, 59 in Floresville, 60 in Pleasanton, 57 for 
places like Sabinal as well as Uvalde. Tomorrow, I do think we will see a little bit more sunshine, especially by lunchtime. Temperatures climbing into the mid 70s at noon and then into the later portions of our Monday afternoon. We've got a forecast high pointed around 83 degrees here in town, 83 in Poteet, 84 in Canyon Lake and 85 in New Braunfels. Somewhat seasonable for this time of year and really for the most part, we are still going to hold on to drier air, low humidity, especially throughout the first half of the day. But you can see by late tomorrow night and even into the early morning hours of Tuesday, that's when high pressure moves southeast. Our winds here at the surface move in from the south and that Gulf moisture is going to work its way back into the area. That Gulf moisture combined with some Pacific moisture also is expected to bump up rain chances a little bit as early as Tuesday for at least parts of South Central Texas. Let's take you out to the Eastern Pacific. This is Tropical Storm Max and then just off to its west is Tropical Storm Lydia. Lydia is the system that we're really going to be keeping tabs on here over the next couple of days. It's expected to make landfall along the western coast of Mexico by Tuesday and then thanks to the higher elevations, it's just going to get torn apart. But thanks to the winds in the upper levels of the atmosphere, we're actually going to see the leftover moisture associated with that system work into South Texas, and that's what helps spark up a few rain chances again as early as Tuesday. So here's the latest look at your future cast tomorrow morning and throughout most of the day tomorrow. We are quiet here in South Central Texas, but by the morning commute 7 a.m. Tuesday morning, a couple of isolated showers possible, especially farther south and east of San Antonio. Then as we get closer to lunchtime, it's possible we start to see a few more showers pop up. Coverage right now slated at about 40%. That could linger in some way, shape, or form into Tuesday night. Then by Wednesday morning, just an isolated shower possible before we dry things out throughout the remainder of the day. Better chances for tapping into a quick shower look to be the farther south and east that you go. Now, temperatures on Tuesday will be very rain-dependent and cloud-dependent. Right now, it's possible we struggle to climb out of the upper 70s. And then after that, we're really going to see those temperatures warm by Thursday, already nearing 90 degrees. But then here comes that next cold front. Right now, it's slated for Friday morning. Another cooler batch of air and drier air works in for the weekend. And as of right now, it's looking like we'll see skies clear just in time for that annular solar eclipse that happens around 11.50. 2 a.m. here in town Saturday morning. We'll talk more about that, all the details of what we are expecting into next weekend for that astronomical event coming up in just a few, guys. All right. All right. Thanks, Mia. We're going to pretend like things are normal, even though they're not right now. Parts <laughs> of West Maui are starting to welcome back tourists months after deadly wildfires. They're devastated thousands of acres across the island. And while some on the island are glad to bring back business that comes with the tourist, others are saying it's a little too soon. ABC's Mola Lenge is in Maui with more on those reopenings. West Maui is back in business, reopening to tourists exactly two months after the wildfire that killed 97 people and destroyed more than 2,000 homes and businesses. The governor felt the 60 days was the date. There were too many businesses that, and I'm talking big businesses, hotels would have gone bankrupt if they couldn't open. The struggling hotels and restaurants eager to welcome back the tourists that fuel Hawaii's economic engine. Dexter Recitus is the manager at the Hula Grill just outside Lahaina. He lost his home in the fire. Still, he's ready to get back to work. I do want to come back. This is some type of normalcy. I love seeing people, just talking to people in general. The refocus on tourism happening as homes on Lahaina are still in ruins. 66 people still unaccounted for. So this is my home here to the right. As he picks up the pieces, Miguel Ceballos insists victims need more time, not tourists. Funerals just started and they want us to go back in. Tawny Katayama lost her third generation family home. I'm not ready to say, you know, get the question, did your home burn down, you know, over and over and over again. More than 16,000 people seem to agree, signing a petition to delay the reopening of West Maui. Nicole Ellison, her mom, kids, and dogs are among more than 7,600 displaced people the Red Cross has housed in 40 hotels. But now they say they're being forced out as those hotels make room for expected tourists. We're just sitting in limbo for days upon weeks.
My favorite part of the show. The Houston Texans saw their modest two game win streak end in Atlanta today, dropping the Texans below 500 this season. But rookie quarterback CJ Stroud continues to play solid football. For a preview of what's on Instant Replay, let's check in with my friend Larry Ramirez. I think it's safe to say the Texans have found their quarterback. I think so. And I know you approve of him as well. C.J. Stroud in the Texans' offense didn't have much success today, but the O-line did protect him on a record-setting afternoon coming up tonight on Instant Replay. It's hard to go out like that. Um, and, yeah, it's, I've been... Uh, done bad in the stadium two times now, so I don't think it's funny. C.J. Stroud is not a fan of the home of the Atlanta Falcons. Still, he completed 20 of 35 passes without a pick to set a new NFL record to begin a career passing the old mark set by Dak Prescott. The Texans' inability to score touchdowns, though, cost them in the ATL. The Spurs held a free scrimmage at the Frostbank Center yesterday, and the fans turned out in a big way, many getting their first glimpse of Victor Wimpenyama in person, and the Rook was showing off his long-distance game along with Zach Collins. That's for you, Courtney. We got Matthew McConaughey in the house. The Longhorns dropped six spots to number nine in the latest AP Top 25 college football rankings following their loss to the Sooners in the Red River rivalry Saturday at the Cotton Bowl. Mary Romanger was there, and she has more. Plus, we got the Dallas Cowboys at the 49ers, San Antonio FC, the Rangers, Astros, and the best of big game coverage, all that and much more right after the night beat. He changed it to, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, after that. <laughs> yes. Watch it, Tim. <laughs> and don't in, tell the family in Cleveland. You're I'm slowly in, becoming a Texan. You're in trouble, Tim. Yeah. We better get out of here. We'll be back after this if I'm still alive. <laughs>